Well, we're live, Dr. Kritsky. I'm just. Oh, thank you. Uh, I just sent you the link to the PowerPoint. All right. It was I'm a rather large that. file. It's a lot, rather large file, but. <laughs> Let's let it download. And meanwhile, I'm going to get started here. Welcome to People's University live stream. Here we go. We're trying to get, we had some technical problems, but I'm going to run the PowerPoint. So just give me a second to download it. Um, before I do that, I'll just make a couple of announcements. Uh, one is that you can win the cicada art that Bob Villamagna has created. And here's the link. One second. By going to the library and taking your picture with the giant cicada that you see there, easy to find. And uh, posting it online with the hashtag BroodPU. <laughs> and uh, I'll show you what the art looks like toward the end of the broadcast tonight when we're in the question and answer section. Um, so let me see. I think I have the PowerPoint now. Hope so. And it's still downloading. And uh, while that's occurring, let me introduce our guest for this evening. We're lucky to have with us uh, the cicada guy, arguably. Um, Dr. Gene Kritsky is Dean of Behavioral and Natural Sciences and a biology professor at Mount St. Joseph University in Cincinnati, Ohio. He received his PhD in entomology from the University of Illinois. He is the editor of American Entomologist and has authored or edited 10 books and over 250 papers on subjects as diverse as entomology, Egyptology, dinosaur biology, and insect mythology. Um, he is the author of this book, The Periodical Cicadas, get in the light, <laughs> which you can win tonight simply, there it is, by asking a question. We're going to give away two copies of this and one of our t-shirts, Brood PU, that I'm wearing. Um, you ask a question, we'll put your name in the hat, and we'll draw a couple of winners. Let me go back now and see if I have the download. I do not. Let me try it again. It is a big file. I put movies yeah. in there. I had a okay. number of things, but uh, there, there it goes. Bear with us, please. Cicadas were gone for seventeen years. We can we can make it here through this. That's right. <laughs> There we go. Let me open this up. And thank you, Sean, for running the slides for me. All right. It's opening. It is a big file, but we got it. All right. Now, I'm going to share my screen. Excellent. You got the sidebar there going as well. So if you wanted to just run the whole show, you can, or uh, have the slides on the side. That's not a problem. I am going to go away. I'm going to run it as a slideshow. Okay. And uh, I'll prompt please. you for I'll prompt you for the change. Just let me know, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Gene Kritz. Well, thank you all for being here this evening. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, this is it, it's all one of these new technology things. Of course, you know they say never work with animals and. Uh, uh, and computers, and what are we doing? We're talking about animals with computers, and so these things happen. But what I want to do tonight is set the stage for what's going to happen to you over the next several uh, several weeks as you go through the uh, the People's University, and that is to set the stage uh, tonight for uh, where are insects, what's insects' place in nature, coupled with what circuit, what are cicadas' place in nature, and then next week we will follow up uh, with uh, details about uh, periodical cicadas in Brood Ten. So let's start right off the bat. Uh, in dealing with uh, what we're going to be focusing on. Taxonomy is the study of classification. Uh, and, uh, of course, the system that we're currently still using is uh, founded by Linnaeus in 1758 and the process of binomial nom nomenclature, which means that every species right now has two names, has a generic name or a g genus is the plural, and a specific name. So, for example, Homo sapiens L stands for Homo sapiens Linnaeus because he described we were the first species he described. Uh, a species that I described after my, my mentor, uh, Frank Young, was Polypinus Youngi. And of course, since nobody knows who the 
pardon me, my expression, nobody knows who I am. So therefore, they have to spell out my name. So it's Paula Pinus Youngy. Next slide, please, Sean. And uh, uh, so that's the way we do classification. However, in today's world, we want our classifications to reflect more than just a categorization. That's uh, uh, it's like putting the, uh, numbers on a book and putting them on a shelf. We group books of similar subjects together on the shelf. We want to group species that have similar evolutionary relationships on our shelf as well. And as an illustration, you know, we have a genus and species, which we just talked about. Similar genera are placed in the families. Similar families are placed in the orders, orders into classes. Similar classes into phyla, phyla into kingdoms. And we've got one step beyond that, the domain level, dealing with, we're talking about the cell structure. And so uh, uh, with that in place, we're looking here at the uh, tiger swallowtail, a honeybee, a, a giraffe, and a zebra. And if we can, next slide, please, Sean. If you were to look at their classification, as Darwin pointed out, and even Linnaeus noticed this, there is a natural branching pattern that followed. And for Darwin, this suggested the evolutionary relationships that we see in life. And so that's what we want our classifications to reflect now is this evolutionary history that becomes a hypothesis that we test using molecular means or uh, morphometric means or uh, fossil records and so on. So next slide, please. So that's the, the, the tools which you're going to be using. I want to focus on the group to the phyla to which insects belong. That's the phylum Arthropoda. And that's a, it is an enormous phylum. And within that phylum, it's broken up to a whole series of categories, of which insects are the largest category. You look at that, about 3.4% are crustaceans. That includes things like lobsters and shrimps and crabs. Uh, spiders, about 5.2%. Beetles, 36.2%, as you can see. Flies, butterflies. Uh, moths and bees and wasps all are between 12 and 10 percent and then everything else all the all the bed bugs all the cicadas all the grasshoppers all the dragonflies everything else falls into like eight per eight point six percent of this so it's a uh, the insects are the largest of all these groups and within those we're going to try to find out where cicadas fit next slide please sean uh, so let's this is a little technical but i don't mean it to be but it's it's to get it, it, it was attributed to Confucius that the first steps towards wisdom is calling things by the correct names. And so we're going to talk about the major classification of arthropods. There are several out there. This is the one that right now seems to have a lot of the interest of the of various zoologists. And we take the phylum Arthropoda and break it up into a series of subphyla. And those subphyla include the subphylum Trilobita, which is an extinct phylum. The subphylum Chilocerata, subphylum Crustacea, and the subphylum Atelocerata. And uh, uh, we'll, we're going to go through each one of these steps to give you a sense about what's the kind of diversity we're seeing in uh, the Arthropoda, and then really zero in on what insects are. Next slide, please. Uh, we have the trilobites. And I'll tell you, I love these things. These are fossils right at, found right at the beginning of the Cambrian period, 500 and uh, uh, 40 million years ago, and they're, they're, they're called trilobite because you can see there are, there's a central axis in the middle, a middle lobe, and a lobe on each side, so there's three lobes. And these are this generic. In fact, at the first uh, beginning of the Cambrian, almost 70% of all animal fossils were trilobites. Once we discovered the Burgess Shale, however, that number went away. But this is the oldest and very generic arthropod and right now is the leading candidate to be close to, if not the ancestor, uh, to everything else that we've got. Uh, we have nothing else that, that fits as well as being in the right time frame, the trilobites. I moved to Cincinnati because of trilobites. Uh, uh, I, I collected fossils in North Dakota and Montana as a kid, and I, but I lost it after trilobites. Now that I'm out here in Ohio, I can find trilobites all the time if I want. Next slide, please. So that's our, our subphylum. Uh, trilobita, uh, very generic. The Chilicerata are, are arthropods in which the first pair of appendages are modified into Chilicera. And uh, uh, they can be fangs, they can be all sorts of structures, uh, as, we, as we'll talk about. And so uh, uh, the, uh, the most generic one we've talked about is indeed what you see there in the upper left-hand corner of the inset, and that's the Xyphosurin, or a horseshoe crab. Uh, the horseshoe crabs are 
a, a fascinating group of organisms. Uh, next slide, please. You probably see them along the coast of the Atlantic. Uh, they are, if you look superficially at them, you see three lobes. On the one on top, you'll see that middle lobe in the center, and then on each side, the to the, the, what you see is the, the, the carapace. If you flip them over, you see the legs underneath that are separate from that. That's what trilobites are about, like. That structure, you see, those were the actual walking appendages. They were underneath that covering that you sh I showed you in that fossil. Can we go back one, please? Uh, after the xiphosurin, one of the interesting things is if you look at a larval xiphosurin, it looks like a little mini trilobite. It's really kind of cute. Uh, the pycnogonids are the next class, and these are the sea spiders. And sea spiders are these things that you'll see that in figure uh, two, but just below the horseshoe crab on the uh, slide. Let's go ahead, two slides, please. Uh, the, uh, these pycnogonids are these really long, spindly legged things. They're so, they're, uh, they have a reduced number of body segments. They got very long legs. Uh, they're so small that the digestive and reproductive organs extend into the legs. Uh, uh, they're all marine and they are of special interest to, uh, NASA because it's felt that these things live in, uh, depopperate environments, environments that don't have a lot of nutrients present and a, and a robust source of food. And that if we we're going to find life on alien planets like Mars, where there doesn't seem to be a lot of ob obvious food sources, we would try to find things like this. And so uh, NASA for a while has been uh, considering looking, uh, how would you detect a pycnogonid, for example, uh, if you uh, uh, we're trying to determine alien life. And they may have just seen just recently uh, some of the work on some of the moons of uh, Jupiter may may actually imply that there are some possible uh, life forms on some of these uh, moons of Jupiter and or Saturn. Next slide, please, Sean. The scorpions. This is within the class Arachnida, which includes four orders. The scorpions, the order of spiders, the order of daddy long legs, and the orders of mites. And this is a typical uh, scorpion. The arachnid form has more segments fused in the head and thorax region. So you can see right behind those little pincers has a long section of the fused cephalothorax that you see there. The um, uh, the remaining segments that you see either uh, uh, in these things for in these uh, arachnids either form an abdomen or there it's either more or less fused. So in some cases, in this case, you can see that the the uh, abdomen is partially modified into that stinger that you see present here. That's the uh, the order Scorpionida. Uh, next is uh, next slide, please. Uh, we have the spiders, and these are the arania. Uh, spiders are well, quite a fascinating group of animals, in particular. Uh, they uh, uh, have uh, a cephalothorax. The head and the thorax are fused. The abdomen is separate, as you can see here. You have in the upper upper left hand corner is the uh, black widow, and the lower right hand corner is the brown recluse. And then you got some of the some examples of extreme diversity. Leucosa is in the far left, and some of the saltistas in the upper right. So it can be quite colorful. And these are an amazing group of animals uh, that. Um, uh, are just they're just really cool. A lot of people are. Uh, there was an interesting survey done a few years ago that found that tw one of every five entomologists is afraid of a spider. Go figure that. Uh, but uh, they're just quite quite diverse. But they're not insects. Except if you wanted to get a, a, a PhD, let's say studying spiders, you'd either get a degree in zoology or you could get a degree in entomology. Even though they're not true insects, depending on where you wanted to do your your research. Next slide, Sean. We also have when the uh, Within the class Arachnida, the uh, the uh, group of ticks and mites, the Akari, and here we have things like the deer tick, the wood tick, uh, and at the very bottom, I threw that in to just really sort of freak out a little bit. That's a Demodex mite. That is a small arthropod that lives in the pores around your eyebrows, and uh, it's something your mother gave you when uh, when you were being nuzzled uh, as an infant. They are it's a it's it causes us no harm whatsoever. But uh, we have them living on our faces in the pores of our skins. Something to really, really sort of startle you. Uh, it's, it's amazing what lives on and in us. Uh, these are the mites that live on us. Uh, as you know, uh, there was a study done a few years ago looking at the number of bacterial species living in our belly buttons. And they found an average of 1,100 species living in our navels. Uh, one researcher, one microbiologist said, it's like the rainforest in your navel. There's so many bacterial species there. 
there are 600 species living in the crook of your elbow. Uh, it's just amazing what lives on and in us. And uh, so at night when you're sleeping, if you fear you're not alone, you aren't. Your whole ecosystem of organisms living on you and in you. So it's really quite uh, quite amazing. But these are the other arthropods that we see within the uh, within the uh, uh, Chilicerata. Next slide, please. Let's go to the subphylum Crustacea. And this is the subphylum. Uh, next slide, please. That um, includes a number of organisms that we you you may appreciate. Uh, uh, prawns or shrimp, for example. If you eat shrimp, you're eating crustacean. We've got crayfish. If you like uh, uh, crawfish etouffee, if you like uh, crab or lobster, these are indeed uh, uh, crustacean. There are other several groups, the branchiopoda, uh, the ostracods, for example, are all other examples of, of other crustaceans. But this is a large group. And some of the fundamentals look like arthropods evolved to live life in the oceans. Others lived life of gave rise to life on land. Those that gave that that survived to exist in the oceans gave rise to the crustaceans and all the species that entails. And those arthropods that went onto land gave rise in part to the insects, as well as other some other arthropods as well. But those are the two main groups, and they're divided by their ecological association. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one of the uh, terrestrial car our, our th uh, crustaceans that we have are the isopods. And uh, here in Ohio, where I'm located right now, we have uh, about a dozen, 10 to, I think, 10 species now of these terrestrial isopods. And uh, uh, they are sometimes referred to as roly-poly, uh, but you'll find these in your flower beds around the, around the foundation of your house. You're going to find them in moist soil. They can roll up into tight little balls or, or uh, be wandering around. But uh, that's, that's an example of a, a terrestrial uh, crustacean that we have here in the, in the U.S. Next slide, please. Uh, within, uh, besides the uh, crustacea, we've got uh, the subphylum uh, Atelocerata, and here's where it's it really interesting. A lot of people tend to think that insects are all the animals with uh, just six legs, uh, but there are other classes of arthropods that have six legs that aren't insects. And so if we go to the next slide, please. Uh, this includes things such as, well, let's go to the myriapods first, I see here. <laughs> uh, this is, uh, the myriapods have a head, head trunk association uh, where you've got a head and then a whole series of repeated cap, uh, segments that follow it. Uh, similar and closely related to the, uh, the myriapod that we see here are things like the uh, uh, centipedes. Next slide. And here are some of the centipedes that we see in the, uh, in the region around here. And they all have this sort of head and then a trunk uh, 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 body plan, if you will. And then there's a minor group, the, the symphyla. Uh, excuse me, the, sim, uh, the symphyla. And next slide, please. And the symphyla is a microscope form. I've collected many of these. They're about two to four millimeters in length. They've got a head and a trunk. But many people in the past thought these might be this close to an ancestor of the arthropods that we have. We don't consider that this as likely anymore, but they illustrate a fundamental body plan that could link the uh, the uh, uh, insect with the myriapod group, which includes things such as the uh, uh, millipedes and the centipedes and the symphyla. Next slide. So uh, within the hexapods, and that is the myriapoda that we see here at the bottom, uh, diplopods are the millipedes, chylopods are the... Uh, are the centipedes. I didn't spend a lot of time talking about the parapods. We'll go on from that. Uh, and the symphyla is the uh, last group. And they're all illustrated here in the slide to your left. Next slide. Uh, within the subphylum pancrustacea, this is an alternative view that we're looking at. And that's the idea that the crustacea and the insects share a common ancestor, uh, which you got the, the, symphyla, the subphylum pancrustacea, which includes the crustacea. And then within there, we have an epiclass called hexapoda, which includes all these arthropods that have six legs and a head. And not all hexapods are insects, but all insects are hexapods, which is a, a, thing, a thing to note. There are three classes of arthropods that aren't true insects. And then we have true insects. And of course, all this deals with where are cicadas, where are they in the role of nature? And so what I'm trying to get is to convey to you uh, where, you know, where does shrimp, where do shrimp and crabs and lobsters fit within relation to cicadas and so on? They're all arthropods, but they're distantly related. Next slide, please. The Protura is our first group of, uh, of arthropods that uh, 
are hexapods, but not true insects. They're blind, minute. They've got no antennae. And uh, uh, they basically, their four legs stick out in front of them so they can sense the environment with that. But there are indeed six-legged arthropods, very minute for microscopic. Next slide, please. We have the columbola, and these may be some of the most common arthropods you're going to find. They're found in flower beds. You can find them in, in uh, uh, potted plants. These are things that are sort of hot. They look like they are literally jumping around. They call it common or springtails, and they're extremely common uh, here in the, in the U.S. They've got a uh, – if you, if you touch them, you can actually scrape off some of the seed that they have, and that's where that, that pattern that you see on the, on the backs of these things. Uh, but the uh, the uh, the columbola are a, a fascinating group. They've got a jumping structure, uh, which is is capable of of causing them to actually be propelled up to fifty body lengths and so on. Uh, it's a quite an interesting group of arthropods, uh, but also not an insect. Next slide, please. The last group that's not an insect are the diplura, and these are really kind of either about three, four millimeters in length, and they've got those two long filaments out of the end. They're called cerci. Some are just long uh, leg-like structures you see here. Others are modified into a forceps. The, uh, the uh, diplura are elongated forms. You find them in caves and soils and under roots and whatever. All the ones I've ever collected, I've collected in leaf litter. So that gets us now all the arthropods out of the way except for the true class insecta. Next slide, please. And the class insecta is the largest group of organisms out there. I'm not going to go through every one of these tonight, but just to give you a sense about what kind of diversity we're seeing and where cicadas fit into this. We can divide these things up into primitive wingless insects, primitive winged insects, insects that can fold their wings, insects that can fold their wings and have a complete metamorphosis, and then insects that can fold their wings and have an incomplete metamorphosis. That's not necessarily given an evolutionary order, but it helps us understand where cicadas fit. So let's start out with, uh, next slide, please. Uh, the archaeonatha, these are the bristle tails. You may even find these in your house every once in a while. These things feed on things like dried wallpaper paste and the glue that binds books together. Uh, these are the bristle tails. They are primitively wingless. We find members of the Archaeonathan are close relatives of the Archaeonathan back in the fossil record of the Permian. They are clearly insects. Uh, they have, a, uh, as you can see from the one on the upper left, uh, they've got a hump back, they've got elongated mouth parts, and uh, long antennae, and the, uh, um, uh, the, the two cerci, the smaller structures of the abdomen, and then the uh, long uh, uh, telson, if you will, out of the very tip of the abdomen. Now, what makes a true insect? Why are these insects and other things aren't? Insects have internally inside their, uh, their head a complete tentorium, which is a, a bridge work of where muscles are attached. But it's interesting, in the evolution of the insects, the first six segments of that millipede and centipede, our symphylon-like ancestor, merged, evolved, merged together to form the insect head and their mouth parts. The next th three segments formed the thorax, which is where you find the wings and the legs, and the remaining 11, 12 uh, segments make up the abdomen. And from that, that's what makes insects so successful, excuse me. It's these segments of repeated units are like an evolutionary tinker toy system, which allowed evolution to, to evolve this wonderful group that is malleable and can adapt to all sorts of situations. And so uh, uh, from this primitively wingless form that we see the Archaeonathan, we will then from here go on into some of the most advanced insects that have ever evolved. So, Archaeonathan, bristletails. Next, please. The Thysanura is a second order of uh, primitively wingless insects, but unlike the Archaeonathans or the bristletails, they don't have that hump, uh, but they are, as you can see, they have six legs, they have good antennae. All three of the structures off the tip of the abdomen are the same length. These are called silverfish. Uh, they are often commonly found in the home. Uh, in many cases, you might find them in the bathtub. I often find them uh, that they run through the, you know, your, your pipes are not filled solid with water. The water is usually along the very bottom. And these things can run along the top of the pipe and they'll get up, run up into your bathtub and they're insects. They just don't know how to get back down. So so it's a, it's a neat group to find. But uh, these are often found in the homes. Next slide, please. Our next stage is the primitively winged insects. And these are insects like, the, there's two groups, the order of Ephemeroptera, which are mayflies, 
and the order Odonata, which are the dragonflies. And they have wings with a rich series of cross veins. You can see here on the, on the, on the mayfly on the, on the right-hand side. And they cannot fold their wings, meaning they can't take their wing and fold it up and tuck it under something or over their back. Uh, these wings are sticking out, so they can't really easily run under surfaces or in between rocks and what have you. Mayflies, uh, as the name implies, uh, they've got aquatic immatures, and they have these very primitive wing systems that we're seeing here. Next slide, please. The order Odonata are the dragonflies and damselflies, and I'm sure you've all seen these. They're broken up into two parts. The order Zygopter are the damselflies, these very delicately winged dragonfly things. They're beautiful animals. Uh, and again, they are primitively wingless. As you can see on the lower, uh, uh, as on the lower uh, left, uh, the wings cannot fold up. They're actually held, the, the, the thorax is evolved in such a way that when the wings are at rest, they're, they're flat over the back. But uh, if you look at the one on the right, you'll see the wings are held straight out from the thorax. And that is not an easy insect to crawl under things to get away from predators. Uh, next slide, please. Dragonflies, by the same token, uh, the order Odonata, uh, they're in the summer Anisoptera. They have these large membranous veined, uh, 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 membranous wings with multiple veins, uh, cross veins. You see here in this illustration, uh, these are ancient, ancient insects. They go back way before the time of the dinosaurs in the fossil record. And so they're, they're paleopterous, paleo for like paleontology, meaning own paleopterous, opterous for winged. They're ancient winged forms. Next slide. The next major step in the evolution of insects was the ability to fold the wings. So that's the tuck the wings over each other to make the insect narrower and smaller so they can crawl into spaces. And, uh, the uh, most primitive of these is the order Plecopter or stoneflies. These have aquatic immatures, just like the dragonflies and the damselflies and the mayflies. Uh, but in this case, these guys can actually fold their wings over their back. Uh, stoneflies are very popular with uh, fly, fisher, uh, fly fisher people uh, who like to uh, make their own flies for fishing. Uh, they're quite... Uh, uh, they're, 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 they're quite an elaborate group of, of organisms. What I find most unique about them are the winter stoneflies. And these are adult insects that come out in the dead of winter. I've been out in 23 below zero temperature where the cricks have, have literally frozen over except for a little rivulet, maybe four inches wide. And going through there, you'll find living uh, stoneflies. Really quite fascinating. Next slide, please. The uh, polyneoptera. Now, what the next up, poly means many many folding winged insects. This is a whole group of organisms that have chewing mouth parts and they have, if they're winged, they can fold their wings over their back. So they're new winged, not ancient wings. That's what the Neoptera means. And there's a whole group of things which I'm sure you're familiar with. One is the order Phasmida. Those are the walking sticks. And the walking sticks we have here in North America look like little sticks. If you go to South America and Africa, you'll find these things are also modified to look like leaves and what have you. A very interesting group, uh, the order Phasmida. Next order, please. Next slide. The Orthoptera is a large group that has some economic importance. Those inc these include things like the grasshoppers and the crickets uh, and uh, katydids. The, uh, uh, they have jumping hind legs and chewing mouth parts. And uh, some of them, as you see, like in the upper uh, right-hand corner, are cryptically colored to blend in with, the, uh, with vegetation. Indeed, as, with, as the summer progresses, you're going to hear this, the, the, the typical <laughs> call of the uh, katydid making calls in the, uh, in the canopy of trees. Next slide, please. Blatteria is the order of cockroaches. Uh, cockroaches are a very ancient group. We have cockroaches way back in the, in the Carboniferous, except those cockroaches were about the size of our hands, five to six inches in length, and they had long ovipositors that have since been lost. Uh, the Blatteria are sometimes linked together into a, a large order uh, called Dictyoptera, which includes our next slide, please. Things like termites, uh, uh, which are essentially cockroaches that have gone social. Uh, termites is probably one of the most economically important uh, pests that we have in the insect world. Uh, we spend uh, considerably more money every year on protecting our homes from termite damage than we do repairing our homes from uh, tornadoes and hurricanes. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is what you'll oftentimes see if a uh, uh, with our common uh, subterranean termite. They need to live in the soil, but they need to they connect fiberboard or wood by creating these little 
mud tunnels. And those little lines you see all through that, uh, between those, uh, the drywall studs there are basically little tunnels made up of, of, of mud that have been uh, sort of brought up by the termites to keep them in contact with the soil. Next slide, please. And uh, here's a video I took of a, of a, a home in, uh, uh, in western Cincinnati. And there's one of those little tunnels. I scraped away in the middle. And I'll zoom in on this in a second. Uh, but you'll actually be able to see the termites walking through this. It's, this is what's probably the most incredible infestations I've ever seen. Uh, let's see if we can zoom in here. Here we go. And you can see the termites just literally walking through that from one section to the next. Uh, it's it's sort of a, a fun thing to say, yes, you can still treat this home. In this home, I was just at this uh, facility. It's now a nature center, uh, and uh, it is termite-free. So it's possible to treat these and save the structure. But that illustrates the kind of uh, infestation you can have of, of these uh, termites. Termites and cockroaches share a lot of features together. And generally speaking, termites are considered cockroaches that have gone social. Next slide, please. Also included in the same group, the order Dictyoptera, is also the order Mantodia or the praying mantises. And uh, the praying mantises, uh, also called rear horses, praying nuns are another example uh, of their common name, are voracious predators. And uh, uh, again, the three things that link these together, cockroaches and termites and uh, uh, mantids uh, share a number of fundamental features, which in the past has linked them together into a single order, the order Dictyoptera. But they've also been separated into three orders, the order Blatteria for roaches, the order Isoptera for termites, and the order Mantodia for, for uh, uh, the praying mantids. I'm going to stop, stop you for a second and say, are you getting a feel for the kind of diversity we see in the insect world? It is just incredibly diverse. And we haven't gotten near the, the cicadas yet. That To sort of figure out where the cicadas fit in all this, you need to realize where they are to what they are. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so uh, the order of Dermaptera, this is one of my favorites. Uh, these things have uh, uh, these like tweezers off their abdomen, modified cirrusy. Uh These are called the earwigs. And uh, uh, the uh, they have wonderful low, roundish wings that are actually uh, held underneath these very short elytra. Now, I don't think I can get my cursor in here. I don't know if you see this or not, but there's elytra that I'm uh, and the wings are just sticking out towards the end here. These are the earwigs. Next slide, please. And so that takes us through the major orders of the uh, polyneoptera. There are several others I didn't touch on uh, that uh, have been discovered in recent years. That uh, Now let's get into the, uh, into the whole metabolus insects. Now there's another group in between to which the cicadas belong, which is a, an evolutionary side branch. But we're going to go to the whole metabolus insects first. And uh, talk about these uh, these insects with a complete metamorphosis. A complete metamorphosis means that the larvae don't look necessarily like the adult, and uh, uh, they have a pupil stage, a quiet, in some cases a stage where they undergo a completely internal reorganization that lets them uh, uh, that occurs before they become the adult. Eighty five percent of all insects have this kind of development. Uh, all the insects we've talked about so far up to this point don't have this kind of development, and a lot of diversity there but not with regard to the total numbers of species. These are the megalopterans or the Dobson flies. Look at these things. Those large mandibles are sexually dimorphic compared to the females. Uh, these are wonderful aquatic insects uh, that I've collected many times in the stream here, streams here in Southern Ohio. Next slide, please. Uh, so, so closely related to and sometimes placed in the same order uh, is the order Neuroptera. And these are the things like the lace wings. There's the brown lace wings, the green lace wings. There's a very important agricultural beneficial insect. And then the mantispids. And you're looking at a mantids, a mantispid, or commonly called mantid fly. I think there's another next slide, please. Yes. You can see on this slide here in the upper, upper right hand corner, it looks like a praying mantis with big raptorial forelegs, but they're not at all, not at all. Um, closely related to the praying mantis, that this superficial resemblance is a convergent evolution. These insects have a complete metamorphosis, which is quite fascinating. Uh, in addition to these, we've got things like ant lions. Next slide. And these ant lions create, are things you might, if you go out into a cave area or you have a bar and it's got a large overhang and you look at the ground, you'll see these little conical pits. And these insects, the larvae of these insects, 
walk in circles, throwing over their backs bits of sand to create these, these pits. And if an ant walks into these pits, it's so steep on the side, the ant slides down. At the very bay, base of these conical pits, you find the ant lion larvae ready to grab the ant and pull it under and suck all the ant juices out of it. Next slide, please. This, is a, this should be a video showing, there is, you see in the middle there, an ant lion larvae uh, trying to get away from my disrupting him, her. Uh, as she, uh, they tend to walk backwards as they throw the stuff over their heads. But you can see some of the pits there uh, associated with the uh, with the ant lion. Fascinating group of animals. They got these round sickle shaped mandibles that they puncture into their prey, and they've got grooves that that sucks all the juices out of their prey. Uh, next slide, please. The biggest of all these, the the monster of all these orders, with uh, well over four hundred thousand species, probably even more than that by now. Are, is the order Coleoptera. These are the beetles. There are more species of beetles than anything else in the insect world. And there are diagnostic features. There's a forewing modified into an elytron, which is like a hard, a hard, a hard covering that covers their membranous wings and the flight wings underneath. Uh, incredibly diverse. What you're seeing just this slide alone include things like ground beetles at the top, History beetles in the middle, we've got hydrophilic beetles. And at the very bottom, we've got things like fireflies and lysid beetles and soldier beetles, just to name three. A very, very diverse group uh, and uh, just fascinating. And there are people that just, you know, go nuts about it. Uh, Haldane, a great geneticist, was asked if he'd learned anything about, about the deity from his, from his study of nature. And he responded, a great fondness for beetles. And one of the great beetle workers that we have, coleopterists in the country, is Art Evans, who will be one of your speakers uh, coming up. So he'll tell you more about beetles. But this is a, a very fascinating order. Next slide, please, Sean. The Hymenoptera are the bees, wasps, and ants. And uh, this is another large group, 100, over 100,000 species of these uh, insects. They include things like uh, ichneumonid wasps that you see in the upper middle, ants in the upper right, uh, and then various types of wasps on the far left in the middle row is a, a vespid wasp. The next two next to it are sphesids. A honeybee is down in the lower uh, lower left. And the honeybee has a hind leg with a little, little groove in it where it can pack pollen and so on. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we see uh, uh, in, divide, divided in two groups. The uh, previous slide showed the uh, symphyta, and those are wasps that do not have a constriction between the abdomen and the thorax and the apocrita do. And so things like you see the ichneumonid wasp on, this, on the slide on the left, that stings a caterpillar and, and uh, uh, drags it back to its nest. The honeybee in the middle there uh, with its pollen basket uh, just filled with pollen to take back to the hive. Next one, please. And honeybees, very important economic a uh, group of animals. Uh, we, uh, you've heard that cliche. It's been, it's been thrown into doubt a little bit, but uh, uh, we have uh, uh, that that cliche that one out of every three bites of food you take required a bee. It may require some pollinator, but we're, but it's probably a generalization. Can you all see the queen bee in this slide? Can you find the queen bee? She's at the upper, upper right hand side towards one o'clock. You'll see that the, the insect with the longer abdomen is indeed our honeybee. Next slide, please. So uh, we're almost done with our survey before we get to where the cicadas fit. The order Mecopter, I bring this up because it's one of my favorites. These are the scorpion flies. And scorpion flies had a much richer diversity back in the Permian uh, than they have now. Uh, they include, they're include they called scorpion flies because the male genitalia is held up over the back like the tail of a scorpion that we saw a little bit earlier. Uh, very interesting group of predators. Uh, they're getting a lot of discussion right now because it turns out they are closely related to the next slide. Fleas. In fact, the order Siphonaptera or fleas, in many texts, you're going to start seeing this being revised. Fleas are now considered scorpion flies. We've got good morphological evidence and good DNA evidence, and now uh, a good uh, phylogenetic analysis suggests that indeed fleas evolved from a scorpion fly ancestor and so for that reason fleas are being are, are probably in the next few years if not already uh, going to be moved into the order mecoptera fleas are these things that you you find in your dogs and your cats they're laterally flattened and if you ever chase after a flea in your pet they run between the hairs like a, a like, like like no no get out uh but uh they are are quite uh, 
uh, uh, quite an amazing animal. And when you, if you should uh, go into entomology even further and go into detail, you'll see some some uh, uh, scorpion flies, for example, that wingless scorpion flies that look like fleas, but they're not dorsally, la they're not laterally flattened. They they're rounder. But if you look at them on the side, they look very superficially like like fleas. Next slide, please. We've got just a couple more groups to go before we get to the cicadas, and that's the order Diptera. These are the flies uh, and mosquitoes, and they include a number of, gr of, of fascinating groups. You'll see there's the mosquito in the bottom there. Uh, we also have uh, crane flies, things that look like mosquitoes that aren't like uh, those are those are uh, our, 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 our midges, if you will, our chironomids. Uh, these are defined by the, the, the term Diptera, die meaning two, two-winged forms. Uh, they include such major things as our house flies, our mosquitoes, our horse flies, deer flies, and so on. Next slide, please. Um, the last two orders I want to talk about before we get into the group to which the cicadas belong are the order Trichoptera and the order Liptera, uh, dip, uh, Lepidoptera. Excuse me. The uh, Trichoptera are uh, a fascinating group of aquatic insects. They've got aquatic immatures and terrestrial adults, and the Terrestrial adults used to be called water moths a century, over a century ago because they look all superficially look like moths, except they're hairy rather than scaly. And uh, what's really kind of cool is their larvae form. Their larvae, as you see in the bottom slide here, the bottom photograph, uh, will glue around their outside a little, a little uh, test, if you will, a little uh, case, uh, which uh, arcadis is what it's called, that is, in this case is made up of, uh, of uh, small stones, uh, uh, glued together, and they they uh, live in streams and and capture foods products that go go past them in the streams. Uh, a fascinating group of of uh, uh, organisms. All the aquatic insects that we've been talking about, things like dragonflies and damselflies and stoneflies, and now uh, uh, catus flies, uh, those are all very important biodiversity indicators. If you uh, go out to a stream somewhere and you collect all these aquatic insects. You can look up what's the tolerance, the maximum and least tolerance levels of dissolved oxygen and phosphates and nitrates, what have you. And you can find that zone that overlaps with all the species that you have. And that tells you a lot of information about the water quality. So a nice application of what kind of things you can see with the diversity. Next slide, please. Our order Lepidoptera are the butterflies and moths. 112, 120,000, somewhere about 110 to 120,000 species of these. Only about 13 species of butterflies. The rest are moths. And uh, you're familiar with these things, such as monarchs and and, and sulfurs and swallowtails and what have you. A very important group, closely related to the Trichoptera, but a uh, a very important group. We have a number of economic pests within the order of Lepidoptera. It's not that the moth is the pest as much as the larvae is the pest. Uh, things like corn earworms and things like that. Uh, but the uh, uh, the order of Lepidoptera. Next slide, please. Now let's get into the group within which we find the cicadas. And that includes, there are three orders of the paraneoptera. Para meaning side, neoptera, para. It's a side branch from the polyneoptera. has just three orders. The cicodia, the, the bark lice, true lice uh, are in this group. The order thysinoptera, which are the thrips, and the order hemiptera, the order to which we find cicadas. And uh, next slide, please. The, uh, the socoptera are things like bark lice, and book lice. The uh, slide in the middle, the picture in the middle, is that of a, a beautiful little bark louse. They've got a unique shape to the head. They hold their wing tent shaped. They've got a wing venation that's quite diagnostic. And when you see these things, that's they're, 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 there's no mistaking of what they are. I often find these in things like uh, Berlazi leaf litter samples. The picture on the far left is a book louse. And if you go to a library and you pick up a book, let's say it hasn't been looked at in, in years, you might sometimes open it up and you'll notice a little dot of dust that seems to be moving on the pages. And that's a book louse. They're not a louse that's going to infest us with any kind of concern, but they're lice that you find in old, in the pages between books. And so uh, it's an important, uh, not an important group, but it shows some of the diversity. Within the order Socodia, uh, which includes the bark lice, we also find our true lice. Next slide, please. Which includes things like the uh, uh, the uh, malafaga, the chewing lice, and the anaplura, the sucking lice. And some of these things, like the uh, the body louse and the crab louse, crab louse you see on the uh, uh, in the color picture on the side, are important ectoparasites on humans. And uh, 
Uh, they used to be in their own order. But that now has been uh, uh, has a sub, so, so essentially subsumed within uh, uh, within the uh, the uh, Sakodia. Uh, but uh, we, this is where we find things like our our true lice. Next slide, please. Uh, the Thysanoptera are the thrips. These are fascinating little insects uh, that have fringed wings. Uh, uh, they've got wings. You can see the one, the slide in the upper right is sort of flat over the back. But if they stretch out, they've got little fringes on it, like daily, like Davy Crockett fringes, if you will, on a, on a leather jacket. They're missing uh, one other mandible, so they have a symmetrical uh, head capsule in that case. Uh, some of these are very important pests of things like onions uh, and other uh, crops like that. There's also very important greenhouse pests in the order of Thysanoptera. Next slide, please. And now to the group to which we find our cicadas. All that diversity that we've seen so far, that's going to set the stage for all the lectures you're going to have this follows. Next week we'll talk about periodical cicadas, but then after that you're going to get into, into beetles, you're going to get into wasps, you're going to get into all sorts of things. Uh, this will lay the groundwork what's going to happen. Within the group, the last order we're talking about is the order Hemiptera, and that includes three groups: the order, the three sub uh, the suborders Heteroptera, which include things like we see in the slide here. It includes things like the giant water bugs. It includes lace bugs, stink bugs, which you may have seen in your homes in the fall of the year when the brown marmory stink bug comes in. And hopefully, you've never seen bed bugs, which are uh, secondarily wingless uh, insects. These all have uh, piercing, sucking mouth parts, uh, which they can use to feed on plant matter or in turn feed on, on humans as well. Next slide, please. Here's three, uh, four examples of some of the uh, members of the order Hemiptera. The term hemi means half, terra, wing, half wing. And if you look at the, uh, uh, the, the one on the far left here, you'll see that the very distal end or the very bottom of this thing is membranous and the base of the wing is leathery. And the same is true with the one second from the left. You have that red leathery base, the black with the white dot, that's membranous. Uh, if you look at the one on the far right, the uh, brown uh, is 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 uh, the leathery wing, and the black towards the tip of the thing is is membranous. Um, the one in the middle, of the second from the right, is a uh, uh, unique headed bug. It's a, a a true bug. It's I did my PhD thesis work on this animal, and it does not have a true hemelitra, but it is a primitive hemiptera. Uh, it's the most primitive known of these groups. It's all membranous wings. This includes a number of economic pests, uh, the uh, the tritomini, which spreads, which spreads Chagas disease, for example, uh, among the group, and, and of course, I already mentioned the bed bugs. So that's the suborder Heteroptera. Next slide, please. We've got two other suborders to talk about. Uh, one is the suborder uh, Alcanorinca and the suborder Sternorinca. The suborder Alcanorinca includes the group to which cicadas belong. Uh, uh, the for, figure 1431 that you see here is a cicada. They have uh, uh, large compound eyes, piercing second mouth parts, totally membranous wings, and they include a variety of, of species. And I'll talk about them in a few minutes. But closely related to them are the tree hoppers, which you see in the, the middle there on the figure 1432. Uh, I said it's a leaf hopper, the leaf hopper in figure 1432, and the tree hopper on the middle right. The suborder Sternorinca includes things like aphids and white flies and the scales. So cicadas as a group are closely related to, more closely related to aphids than they are to bed bugs, but they're all within the same order. And so that's quite a, a quite an amazing uh, uh, process we see there. Next slide, please. And so uh, we're looking here at some of the, uh, the characteristics of uh, aphids or the ones that you see in the yellow. Uh, uh, the scale insect looks like a little scab on that on that apple that they're looking at, and underneath there's a series of uh, you'll find the uh, immature form living under that scale, and then the white flies look like little miniature flies with white wings, and that's figure 1434, but also what you see in the bottom uh, middle uh, photograph there, and they're in the Cernorinca. So within that group, what links them all together are piercing, sucking mouth parts, and within that group. You've got include the cicadas, within, that's within the uh, Alcanorinca. Next slide, please. And uh, the Alcanorinca, uh, the cicadas, you see the very far right image is one of the South American uh, Alcanorincans. We have a leaf hopper at the top. You've got a lantern fly in the middle. And the lantern fly is going to be a relative of the uh, cicadas you're going to hear a lot about in, in the months to come. It's the new major pest 
that we have coming into the U.S. It was um, first noted a few years back in eastern Pennsylvania. It's now made its way across uh, Pennsylvania. It is on the Ohio border. You're likely to be seeing this soon in West Virginia as well. And it's a ma of major concern uh, for our uh, uh, agricultural systems here in the U.S. So it's the next pest that we're going to be, be sensitive to. Uh, but these are all members of the Alcanorincans. Oh, it's, again, piercing second mouth parts. Uh, uh, quite uh, easily identified with uh, the oral shape. Next slide, please. And this is our our family within that Alcana rinks, we got the family, family cicadidae, the family of cicadas. And this year, as you know, we have uh, brood 10 of the periodical cicadas emerging. And uh, uh, right now, I'm, I was pleased to say that just before this uh, program started, I was out on my back deck listening to a massive chorus of brood 10 here at the house. But uh, periodical cicadas that would come out once every 17 years, at least with the 17-year forms, there's also 13-year cicadas, uh, aren't the only cicadas we have. There are around 3,400 species worldwide. Here in the United States, uh, and I'll take Ohio as an example, uh, we have 20 species of cicadas in the family cicadidae in Ohio, six species of periodical cicadas, and 20 species, excuse me, 14 species and subspecies of annual cicadas. And the annual cicadas, which you see on the left, are green, black, and brown. They have green eyes, some of them black eyes. Uh, they're bigger than the periodical scales, which are the three that you see on the right. They uh, uh, are the they come out usually in early July and hang around into uh, uh, until uh, early October. Very different life history strategy. They come out in very small numbers. They are cryptically colored, camouflage in the trees. You might hear them singing and calling, but it's hard to find them. On the other hand, the periodical scales, which you see on the far right of the this, this, this screen, red eyes, black bodies, orange colored veins in their wings. Uh, they come out in May and last until the end of June. And they come out in massive numbers to overwhelm predators, giving the predators all the food they can possibly consume. And then there are still millions left. Next slide, please. And within the periodical cicadas, there are two life cycles. The brood 10 cicada, which is coming out this year, uh, is a 17-year uh, periodical cicada. And you can see uh, there are two sizes. Uh, uh, we have one large species and two smaller species. And they're easily separated by turning them over and looking at the underside, where you can see the color pattern. The magic cicada, uh, septum decim on the bottom left, has broad orange bands. Uh, magic cicada cassini in the middle is all black on the underside and Magis cicada septendecula, very narrow, narrow bands on the abdominal segments. But we'll get into the periodical cicadas next week. So when we think about where are cicadas in nature, they are members of the phylum Arthropoda. The arthropods include everything from, from trilobites to horseshoe crabs to spiders to scorpions to, to uh, uh, mites and ticks. Within that group, they also belong. Also, in the arthropods, we have things like millipedes and centipedes and symphylons. We've also got uh, a whole series of closely related arthropods with six legs, like columbola, springtails, and protura and diplura. And then we've got the insects. And the insects are even bigger than all the others combined. And we've got the large order, the order of beetles, the coleoptera, the large order of hymenoptera, the bees, wasp, and ants, the large order of diptera, the, the, uh, the, the flies and mosquitoes, and the order of Lepidoptera of butterflies and moths. Those four, those four orders have over 800,000 species in those orders. Among the minor orders is the order Hemiptera, which includes the family cicadidae, the family to which the cicadas belong. And so within that diversity, this minor order and this family cicadidae, which has only seven species, has been taking our focus of interest. That'll take us into next week's lecture. So thank you very much for your attention. Sean, I think I can entertain any questions people might have. Okay. Let's do that. Well, there, there's my question, one of them. Why are they songs so loud? Yes, we'll get into that next week as well. But the uh, uh, it's one of the interesting things about cicadas. Uh, the annual cicadas, when they sing, they're vulnerable to predators because predators can hear them. 
which is one of the reasons why they need to be hidden per se. But uh, annual cicada, the periodical cicadas, those uh, the songs are uh, they're they're gathering in trees called chorusing centers. The males are competing with other males to get the attention of a female. So having a loud call is going to be beneficial uh, in attracting the attention of a female. Once she gets the attention, she can't sing. She can't respond. But she responds by flicking her wings. And that wing flick, if the male sees it, he turns and faces her. And then he'll sing again. She'll flick her wings. He'll sing again, flicks her wings, and it goes through a series of mating calls. I'll go into more detail on that next week. But uh, that's uh, that's what keeps the cicada, the periodical cicadas, at least coming back once every 17 years. Okay, I'm going to put this up on the screen. It's very long, and it's from a young man named Miles, who's seven years old, and he has several questions. So, Excellent, Miles. Let's take a look. Are centipedes venomous? Uh, centipedes have uh, uh, cyanide glands, which can, which is how, how they used to, to sort of paralyze their prey, if you will. Uh, they can cause quite a bite if you're not careful. Millipedes, on the other hand, are herbivorous and uh, uh, other than some of them having repugnant glands and producing smells that are rather off-putting, uh, they aren't, aren't as dangerous. Uh, what's more of the question there, Sean? Yeah, let me put it back up. Um, I thought I saw a tarantula hawk wasp in my garden, but I don't have any tarantulas to eat. Uh, not being a hymenopterist, I can't speak to the, uh, the spider wasps in your state. There are several spider wasps in your state. Uh, uh, what type of spider does it eat? I have seen uh, wa uh, spider wasps, pompillas, uh, go after things like the uh, wolf spiders. I've, this is amazing. You'll see this large, this, these rather large spiders you'll find out in the ground. I've seen them paralyzed and, and w these wasps dragging them across my slab of my back, a uh, uh, pavement below my deck, and then stuffing them into a, a little mud, uh, a mud structure, laying an egg on it, and then sealing it up to provision that with that uh, paralyzed spider. And so uh, that's quite a, quite a fascinating thing to see. Uh, more well, to the question. Let's put it up again and see what else we have. Uh, what uh, why do mosquitoes bite some people more than others? Um, well, <laughs> uh, I know you're, you're talking about those instances where there are people who literally they can be, you could be out there in a backyard and for whatever reason, all the mosquitoes are congregating on one individual versus the other. Uh, there is a billion dollar product out there for someone who can figure out what's going on. Uh, there are hundreds of volatile compounds produced in our sweat and, uh, uh, we, if we can figure out what we could modify or how we can modify that to make our sweat re repulsive to mosquitoes, that'd be a big, uh, a big uh, advance for uh, humankind. There are some mosquitoes that like to bite around the ankles, and some that bite higher, that bite a lot higher on the body. I take students to Egypt on uh, on tours, and there is a mosquito that loves to bite around the around ankles, and we call it the uh, a pox almost because the at the end of that first evening that we've been in Cairo. Their ankles just bit up like crazy from these the, the, these spiders that are biting along that. And there are some, uh, not spiders that are biting, the mosquitoes. Uh, there are some mosquitoes that really go after foot odor, uh, others that do not. Others that are attracted to increase CO2. Uh, they can de detect the warm body temperatures and so on. So there's a much more complex process involved with what makes a mosquito attractive to some people versus others. Wow. I know what you're talking about because my father-in-law, it's like, when you go outside, it's like the mosquitoes know he's there. They're going to put an apple in his mouth and carry him away. <laughs> that he's going to be dinner because they just go after him like crazy. But the rest of us are barely being bothered. So we always invite him to outdoor parties. My grandmother always said, because you're sweet, that's why they bite you. That's that's a complimentary way of saying it. There's other than just, you know, you, know, you drew the short end of that straw. <laughs> just to finish Miles' questions. Um, sure. He We already answered. He asked about why the skaters are so loud. But he wants to know why they have red eyes. Well, the better to see you with. Uh, there is a visual component uh, to uh, cicada mating. Uh, not only do they sing to attract a mate, the male turns. And if he sees the female and she sees him, that can further enhance the uh, mating process. And here's a question from Jerry. Why are they called brood 10? Well, this is uh, uh, Jerry back in uh, 1893. Well, oh, before 1893, there were three different systems, systems involved with naming cicadas, two involving brood numbers, one involving emergence years. The two involving brood numbers 
did not use the same. No, the brood one was not the same for each of the two broods. And it was extremely confusing. And then you added a third system that made that was based not on brood numbers at all, but what year they came out. And you're thinking back and you're you're always subtracting from 17. <laughs> 17 from whatever was the number you had to figure out which brood that would be. And so in 1893, a man by the name of Charles Marlott, who worked for the United States Department of Agriculture, said, let's make some sense out of all this. For every cicada that comes out in 1893, that's a 17-year cicada, we're going to call that brood one. Every cicada that comes out in 1894, that's 17 years, brood two. And numbers one through 17 are, gar are reserved for 17-year cicadas. The 10th one in that sequence came out in 1902. That's brood 10. And that's the brood that, that it, you can say brood 10, 1902 to 1919, 1936, 1953, 1970, 1987, 2004, 2021. That's the next one in the sequence that we have. And so uh, we also have 13 year cicadas. And, and so Marla said, if you're a 13 year cicada and you come out in 1893, you're brood 18, and 18 through 30 mm -hmm. reserved for 13 year cicadas. When we did that, and then we looked back and we converted all the numbers to, to fit that system. All sorts of things fell into place. All of a sudden, the maps made sense. And you could see patterns in the maps. In next week's uh, program, I'll show you the maps of all the broods to give you a sense about how they sort of fleshed out in that process. Our goal this evening was to let you know what, what arthropods were and where the insects fit in the arthropods and where the cicadas fit in those arthropods. And to be, if it, it was an awful lot to go through, and I apologize if it was overwhelming, uh, but uh, uh, you're smart people. You're going to a program like this. And, and, and one of the sheer joys of working with insects is the sheer diversity of what's out there. Uh, you can look, you know, there's 8,000 species of birds. We've got a million species of insects, you know, in the world. So uh, it, it, there's something really fun about this. And uh, uh, I was very impressed when uh, I was asked to talk about the place of insects and uh, the cicadas and the, their place in nature, because that's not often what you're asked. It's, uh, it's, uh, it, it gives you a total appreciation. And uh, for those of you who uh, haven't thought about a career like Miles, uh, you're a young, a young man. Uh, I have a cliche. Uh, and that is entomologists are biologists with a job. Uh, I, li I love being outside. I love being out there looking at working with bugs. I love helping people. I love helping people live more safe and, and better lives. And that's what you do as with as entomologists. Yeah. And there's a whole range of applications from medical entomology to helping stop spread disease to understanding uh, insect products. Uh, you know, insects. So uh, they make uh, insects make honey. They make beeswax that's used in the pharmaceutical industry. It makes lac, which is used to make to, to preserve woods and so on. So it's just an unlimited uh, uh, area of, of study that's just not boring at all. Yeah, and I know we're going to talk a lot more about cicadas next week. So I'll save my questions specifically about them for then. I have a lot, um, including some of the things that humans do, but. Let's go to this question because uh, a lot of people maybe have maybe have moral uh, issues. So here here's this. So we're in a brutal question, but what bugs are okay to kill? I am typically a catch and release in my house for anything but flies and those huge spider crickets that breed in my basement. Well, those spider crickets that you're talking about are probably uh, uh, falsed spiders. Uh, the sort of really long legged things, and you don't need to feel bad if you want to if you end up killing them. Uh, uh, I do, <laughs> I slap mosquitoes and they land on me. Uh, that's uh, uh, it's it's you know, we're we're part of all we're all we're all part of this food chain here, <laughs> and uh, sometimes it's eat or be eaten in that sense. But uh, uh, I, I tend to protect certain insects there, the, for example, within the spiders, these the the saltises, the jumping spiders. They are so personable. They're hairy. They got these great big eyes. They got six others along with them, but they got these two big ones that uh, make them seem so personable. I can't bring myself to kill those. So I catch them and release them. Uh, it, uh, uh, cicadas, I can't kill. So I, I, do, I do take voucher specimens uh, for the museum uh, of the periodical cicadas, but boy, I, I can't eat them anymore. And... Uh, uh, I just like love them too much. They've been too good to me in my career, uh, so uh, that, that's important. But yeah, there are. Gonna, I'm sorry. 
that's one of the things that always comes up when they come out, you know, rest oh, yes. cicadas. I've been uh, everything from Jimmy Kimmel last week. And, and <laughs> uh, when they showed my picture on his show, uh, I said I was ready to eat him. I have never said in any review or in, in, in any interview this entire spring that I still eat cicadas. But yet okay, I do have good. recipes that people have used. I've, I've had them several ways, uh, but sometimes you guys try it for yourself. But uh, all, and the other thing is that brood 10 is, is a, uh, uh, is threatened in some parts of its distribution. And so I'm trying to, to get a good sense of where it's at. Miles says jumping spiders are your favorite. Miles, I don't blame you. They're pretty darn cool, aren't they? They're cool, yeah. There's no way around it. They are just fantastic. Here's a very topical and regional question, I think. Maybe it's not, but you will tell us. What are stink bugs? Why are they swarming us in biblical proportion? What's the best way to deter them? Uh, CJ, uh, I think you're probably talking about the brown marmorated stink bug uh, that uh, a few years ago was even more plentiful than it is now. Uh, the uh, These insects were, were inadvertently introduced into North America uh, and uh, uh, they've spread like wildfire. Uh, and in the winter months, they they find a, hiberna a hibernacula where they like to overwinter as adults and they will cluster. And in Asia, they tend to they they tend to find nooks and crannies on on uh, uh, southwest facing rock faces, and the closest thing we have to that here are south facing walls of our houses, and so they'll gather around the houses. And if there's a they can detect where heat is, and if there is an uh, an opening into your attic somewhere, they will get in there, and they'll start to overwinter there. As you turn your heat on, and that heat gets hotter in the in the attic months they'll start moving around and again they'll find where they'll go where the heat is and they'll find they'll get into the house and uh, most people are not thrilled to have stink bugs in the house uh, so uh, that's that's part of the biology that's going on so if you want to stop them from getting into the house uh, do a careful inspection of where some where are openings that insects get in if you have uh, vents in your attic so that water doesn't condense in your attic uh Get a screen over them so that the screen stops the bugs from getting able to get access to your attic. Things like that. Uh, look at it. Look at areas where uh, some of the bricks and some of the uh, uh, seams around windows may have gaps that you can you can fill in. That's a good thing to uh, do. But uh, what do these uh, brown sting bugs? They're they're they are 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 are, are, are plant feeders, uh, and uh, they actually go after a, a number of things. Um, but what's rather important, I think, for this, it turns out katydids love their eggs. And uh, here in Ohio, we have found in recent, uh, in recent years that the uh, stink bug populations have leveled off and are now dropping as more and more katydids are feeding on the stink bug eggs. So just give it time. And uh, uh, as I said in Jurassic Park, life finds a way. <laughs> right. And, and the earth will survive our folly. <laughs> there you go. I was also from Jurassic Park. But here's a question from our friend Gene. And this is, a, this is something that comes up a lot. We, we've, we've all heard this. I've heard it said that if and when the Earth is destroyed in a nuclear disaster, cockroaches will be the last survivor. Is this true? If so, why? Well, that comes from the uh, some of the experiments that were done uh, out in the far west during the uh, testing of nuclear uh, weapons. And they put things like turtles and cockroaches and all sorts of animals in cages out there and let them be exposed to uh, radiation. And the roaches did a pretty good job surviving. Uh, so, yes, they probably could. Uh, <laughs> uh, again, now, if they were hit at the point at ground zero, they probably wouldn't have fried them. But uh, they could they, just, they did survive some of the ex uh, radiation exposure. But so did so did tortoises and things like that as well. And Pam asks why they're called cockroaches. Well, and actually, there's a long history in the etymology, the study of words is etymology, entomology, study of insects. Uh, they, uh, they used to be called roaches. Then they became cockroaches. But the term, the prefix cock, carried a whole range of connotations. So they, with a lot of people didn't stop using that. And they were called, they're also referred to as uh, German roaches. Then the Germans call them Prussian roaches. The Russians call them German roaches. <laughs> uh, there's a whole range of... Uh, of names like that and and uh it's almost it's a rather rich uh, vernacular to see uh where these names come from and what have you but uh uh it's uh, uh 
Okay. It just has a long history going back to like the 16th century. Um, let's see. One more question and I'm going to um, let you make a couple more announcements and then we'll let you go. Um, let's see. Some people. Okay, here's one. Any, are there any insects that have a completely aquatic life cycle? Uh, when you say completely aquatic, are you saying they live in the water at all times? Um, no, in that because they, they, they tend to have to do one of two things. They leave, they, they leave to fly. Things like the giant water bugs, for example, uh, can fly from pond to pond to pond but they're living in the water otherwise, but they leave and fly and disperse in other ponds. So they, they're out of the water. They're not totally aquatic in that sense. Uh, there are very few insects that are adapted to seawater, for example. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, I think there's only just a handful of species that adapted to, uh, to life in the ocean. Uh, I had a, the question that just came up there a second uh, was, what's the benefit of having an aquatic and terrestrial? Uh, one of the benefits between those is is uh, of course having a, a terrestrial adult and an aquatic immature allows for dispersal. The adults can can fly to another location, lay their eggs in another another pond somewhere. That's beneficial. If you look at the most successful animals, and I talked about them briefly today, things like the butterflies and moths and the beetles and the uh, bees, wasps and ants, and the true flies, uh, all have that complete metamorphosis where you have a caterpillar stage, a pupal stage, and an adult. That that life cycle method is 85% of the insect world. Having adults that don't compete with the immatures is quite adaptive. And so if you've got insects that are aquatic as immatures but are terrestrial as adult, that's a similar process. And so the adults aren't necessarily competing with the offspring for survival. And that can be beneficial. And Jean had a follow-up to her question. The National Museum of Art and Hobart, which is a large cockroach. That's a very interesting observation. I've never been to Havana. Uh, uh, I'd, I'd be curious to see that. And so with that, and that's interesting because we chose sort of to start with cicadas, not only because of Brute 10, but it's a good metaphor for what humans have gone through. You know, we've been sort of underground for a year and a half and we were re-emerging and uh, trying to survive. So... Let me just show you, show the people, and thank you, Dr. Krisky, that was excellent. Oh, thank you, Sean. And let me just show the people what they can win. First of all, I'll show you this. This is a library staff member, Nate, who raises praying mantises, and he's gonna take us on a field trip when this is all over in July. But Nate is showing you what you can do if you come to the library and take a picture <laughs> like this with our giant cicada and put it on the internet with hashtag brood PU, uh, you can then win this. And I'm going to, whoops. Bear with me for one second, because this is, this is the, the big prize. Uh, this is a, and I put Ooh. this in here. There it is. Uh, cicada art by a local artist named Bob Villa Magna, who does uh, mixed media. And this is made with, uh, metal on wood it's about 20 inches wide and and uh 12 inches tall and it's pretty cool uh, we have it at the library and you know bob's work is is pretty coveted so if you uh do what nate did take your picture and post it you'll be entered in the drawing to win this so speaking of drawings let's draw for tonight first we're going to give away a copy of periodical cicadas by our guest tonight dr kritsky and I have the names here in, in my hand. And uh, I'm going to draw one of them. They're all folded up, so I can't see who's what. So the first copy goes to... It's very dramatic. wish I had... <laughs> Thank you. Gene Finstein. So, Yay! Okay, there's Gene, you get a copy of uh, Dr. Kritsky's book. I'm going to give away one more of those right here. If I can unfold, I've, I've folded it so tightly I can't get it open. Here we go. 
Come on now. Drum roll again. Okay. Jerry, Jerry asked a question tonight. So if you get in touch with us, either send me an email or message me with your address. I'll have the book sent directly to your house. And now for the t-shirt, or you can have our Brood PU tote bag. Your choice. Let's give away one of those. And the winner is... Kelsey, that's, so that's Miles. Miles won. That's his mom, I think. Uh, young Miles won a t-shirt or a tote bag. His choice. Get in touch with me and join us next week. Same time, same place, 6.30 p.m. All about Brood 10 and the cicadas, the cicada invasion, the cicada mania. It's going to be great. And I'll ask my cicada questions that I kept in reserve tonight. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Kritsky. Thank you. And uh, yes, uh, my colleague had many questions, so we're going to save them for next week, and we're all looking forward to it. Uh, thanks, everyone who attended. We'll see you next time. Get in the library and, and do this. Win this. This is a great work of art. It'll be worth thousands someday. Goodbye. <laughs>